and you're running. Three, two, one. Cue dickhead! So here we are again with the crap movie review. A place where today's struggling actor is tomorrow's compost. <laughs> oh shit. Hello, Lenny. Yeah, hello, mate. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, hello. Um, yeah, it's Warren, yeah. Um, look, could you come in and finish off a review for us, please? Yeah, well, he's had another accident. Yeah, another one. No, it's not as bad as the last one. But his head has come off. I said his head has come off. He's sitting in a jar in the laboratory at the moment. No, you can't talk to him. I just said his head's come off. It looks like the set of they saved Hitler's brain around here. Yeah, 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 all right, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, just get, get here as soon as you can, mate, all right? Look, boss, are you absolutely sure you want Lenny to do this? Oh yeah, fine, but he is such a punch. Anyway, well, we could always ask Leone to do it again. Leonid, you're not up to this bleeding job, are you? I mean, let's face it, your accent sucks. You know bugger all about films, and in any case, there are no bleeding lines in Russia, are there? You stupid punts. Oh yeah, <laughs> that was funny that was. Yeah, yeah, all right, fine, we'll get Lenny to do it. Oh, uh, by the way, he wants me to put you, um, somewhere else. Somewhere other than the laboratory. I don't like it out here. Blasted wind. I'm getting sand in places where I don't really want it to be. Oh, Lenny. Hello. Um, won't you come in? Good afternoon, Warren. I know that you're rather keen that we should get down to business as soon as possible, but uh, before we start the review, is it all right if I um, see him? Yeah, I don't see why not. This way. Oh, Warren. Such a beautiful display. Welcome to the Crap Movie Review. We've got a lot of ground to cover, so strap yourselves in for a tale of magic and mayhem. Which is what I would be saying if we weren't reviewing Troll. Ow! That bloody hurt!
The movie opens with an exterior shot of an old manor house. I'm not sure if it's Nepworth House, it certainly looks like it. But anyway, as the title sequence continues, accompanied by silly music, we get a mix-through shot of a spell book on a lectern stand, before the shot moves outside again for what I assume is a POV shot of the outside of an apartment block where a family is moving in. I think they're supposed to be a typical middle-class American family at the time. Neither the house nor the book from the opening shot figure in the remainder of the film. A family moving in is typical of families in this sort of film. The older child, a boy of about 13, is asked by his mother to keep an eye on his younger sister who is playing ball. After reluctantly agreeing to do this, the mother goes into the apartment building and the father goes round the corner to the local burger bar. The little girl goes into the building, whilst for reasons we are not told, the older brother stays outside. On entering the building, the little girl goes into the basement and plays ball among the municipal laundry machines. Nothing ever good happens in a basement, boiler room or laundry. While she is playing ball, a hand comes out of the side of the shot and grabs her arm. She screams. We see her older brother calling out after her, although not very loudly. Back in the basement, we see the first of many shots of the eponymous troll. Using a magic ring, he has taken control of the little girl's body. When her father gets home with the food, the troll slash girl returns with the rest of the family to their new apartment and proceeds to flip right out. She runs down the stairs and sets off the fire alarm. This is quite useful as we meet the rest of the cast. It's a stereotyped convention. We meet the guy who lives in the apartment below the family, played by Sonny Bono, in a role which I think was the inspiration for Quagmire from Family Guy. We also meet a highly annoying former US Marine called Duke. He has a dim view of people who read books. In addition to him, we also meet the upwardly mobile couple from upstairs, along with the snooty old lady who lives at the top of the block. Luckily, this scene ends before a Saturday Night Live sketch can break out. The family manage to get the little girl back into the apartment, but she still continues to play up. The parents don't seem to do much about this. I am Godzilla, she declares. But, for some reason, the parents seem relieved by this as it means she's just acting out and not mentally defective after all. Phew, that's alright then. In the next scene, we see the newly arrived family at breakfast, still unpacking the odd thing here and there. The boy walks in and is asked where his sister is. I don't know why he has to know that, but anyway. She's in her room in bed. But now, what with being a troll and everything, something appears to be on her mind. She eyes the magic ring on her finger thoughtfully. We cut to Sonny Bono's apartment. It's the morning after the night before, and some unlucky female is shown getting into a row with dear old Sonny, and she storms out. As she leaves, the troll slash girl walks in. After trying unsuccessfully to get rid of her, Sonny Bono is horrified when the girl turns into the troll. They struggle for a bit, and then the troll uses the magic ring to turn the poor man into what first appears to be a giant turd. Well, of course it isn't a turd. It turns out to be a seed pot, from which grows a great deal of flora and fauna. The apartment now looks like a mythical fairyland. Hooray! From the newly formed undergrowth, further mythical and elven folk emerge. By which I mean puppets and animatronics, obviously. These little sods do next to bugger all for the remainder of the picture. A large chunk of the film involves the troll doing near enough the same thing to all but one of the other inhabitants of the block, but you can't fault him on taste. He turns the female of the couple upstairs into a reasonably alluring elven beauty. What he does with her boyfriend is unclear. There is a distinctly un-PC backstory involving a man who has a growth hormone defect which has reduced him in stature. He is, however, doing quite well in life in spite of these problems. He is a professor of English literature. The girl slash troll invites him to the family apartment for dinner, where he recites a poem entitled The Fairy Queen. This sequence is accompanied by the puppet elf folk singing along to the lyric. That's more or less all they do in the whole film. His backstory ends when the troll slash girl takes pity on him and turns him into an elf. Yes, you heard that correctly. Bold as brass, the movie carries on. The older brother is preoccupied with his little sister's newfound weirdness. 
after several sequences where we see him watching a low rent version of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, he concludes that something else has taken possession of her. He makes this point to his parents twice. They didn't seem to get it the first time, and once more to the old lady at the top of the apartment whom he befriends. His new friend turns out to be a witch, and the troll's presence here in the apartment block is simple. He means to exact revenge on her for turning him into the troll in the first place. In addition to this, the troll wants to turn the apartment into a microcosm of the elven universe from long ago. From here, he will set out to conquer the world. Unless, the witch assures the boy, he goes into the growing elven kingdom and rescues his sister. It will not be an easy task. The witch gives him a spear-like magic wand and tells him that his sister will be guarded by a terrible ogre. He must use the spear to destroy it. Nail-biting stuff, eh? To keep the lad from harm, the witch grows younger by about 40 years and enters the elven kingdom which is sprouting up all over the apartment, armed with a sword. Things don't turn out well, and she is turned into a talking tree stump, much to the young lad's ire. The boy, whose name is Harry Potter Jr., yes it is, goes off in search of his sister, who is encased in a glass coffin with a force field around it. He uses the wand to free her. As he does, the troll appears and takes the spear from him, before the aforementioned ogre appears and lumbers about grumpily. Harry is not sure what to do, but as the ogre gets too near to the girl, the troll doesn't like it too much and destroys the beast himself, rendering his plans for global domination defunct. As the movie draws to a close, we see the Potters moving out. Everyone seems to be taking the fact that several people are missing and at least two have been turned into compost remarkably well. The movie ends with two policemen investigating the basement from the beginning of the film. This turned out to be unwise, as the basement is now an elven magic land, even though the troll was defeated. Oh dear, what a shame, never mind. Good evening, law-abiding citizens. This is an appeal for any information you might have regarding a connection between the release of this film in 1986 with a main character called Harry Potter who defeats goblins using magic and the publication of this book some 11 years later. All information received will be treated in the strictest confidence. This movie isn't trying to take itself too seriously, and that's welcome. To be fair, it's a movie about trolls. I'm not expecting anything that's going to make a great deal of sense, and why should I? But when you consider other movies, such as Gremlins, we know why things are kicking off. It's very, very simple. In Gremlins, a strange creature is brought to a suburban home. Certain rules regard how it's supposed to be looked after, those rules are ignored, and everything goes downhill from there. Whereas here, the troll just sort of turns up and that's it. Okay, okay, fine. We know that it's to exact revenge on the witch who lives upstairs. That's okay. But according to the script, he's had centuries to do this. Why does he have to do this here, and why does he have to do it now? He just sort of does, and there we have it. The film is quite meandering, really. Far too much time is devoted to the dispatch of the supporting cast. We don't really get to know any of them, and so we're not all that bothered when they are removed from the screen in a very silly way. The movie really does take its time over these scenes. We see the troll looking on, rather happy with what's happening and quite entertained by it all. Well, I'm glad he is, because I'm bored out of my ass right now. And given the amount of trouble they went to to put the other puppets and other elven folk into the movie, it might have been quite nice if they actually did anything, but they don't. I was entertained, however, by the character of Sonny Bono and his particular character trajectory. A pretty girl walks out of his life after calling him a loser, and very soon afterwards, he's turned into something resembling shit. Now that's satire. I wonder if Ike Turner refused the role. 
the open ending does pave the way for a few sequels, and indeed two sequels to this film were made, but in true crap movie tradition, neither of those sequels had anything to do with the events in this film. That's all for this episode. Thank you very much for joining us, but until next time,